Welcome to Hope and Heresy, Life on the Religious Left, where we wrestle with contemporary issues using history and theology as our guides. Our task is to reclaim religion for everyday people who want to live meaningfully without letting arbitrary doctrine or oppressive religious practice prevent us from asking big questions about our complicated world. I'm Rev. Sarah Lindsay. And I'm Rev. Peggy Clark, and we're Unitarian Universalist Ministers broadcasting from Community Church of New York here in New York City. Well, thank you both so much for being here with us. We are being joined today by (laughs) the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association, Reverend Susan Frederick Gray, and from the executive vice president, Carrie McDonald. And we are so excited that the two of you are with us. We're gonna just, can you to introduce yourselves just so people know who you are and a little bit maybe about what you do in your role? Sure. So um, Susan Frederick Gray, I'm the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. And so that's the head of the denomination. And we have over a thousand congregations primarily, but not exclusively in North America. And we uh, provide services, coaching curriculum to our congregations. We credential religious leaders. We run two publishing houses and, um, a, you know, health plan, all kinds of things. So you know, as president, I am the spiritual and, uh, a, you know, denominational voice for our faith and responsible for a lot of the strategic leadership at the UUA. Well, thanks, Peggy and Sarah for inviting us. And I, I'm glad to be here with you all. I'm Carrie McDonald, uh, as you said, the executive vice president And what that means is that I oversee the day-to-day operations of the UUA as an organization. And so I work very closely with Susan. We talk to each other a lot. Uh, I also work with our board of trustees and a number of our other committees and all of our staff to ensure that we've got the day-to-day things we need um, to keep our association programs and ministries and everything moving. Um, I also... uh, you know, what, whenever there's a, a, a sticky issue or something complicated, uh, you know, that needs a little extra attention, that's what I'm here for. So um, working, in an, working in a denominational setting is there's so many pieces to our role. There's so many congregations and communities to be a part of. And, and we try to show uh, a real ethos of care to our staff and to our local congregations. And so just trying to ensure that that happens uh, day in and day out. Thank you both. So um, we sent you a question, but we want to phrase it a little bit differently now that we're in the same Zoom room together. So um, the question is really, it's really the heart of the matter is the same. But in this moment, I want you to imagine that you've got, you've suddenly been granted one wish and you're able to fix like one thing facing humanity or one thing about the world as we know it. What is that one thing that you think you would fix if you had the chance or change? Doesn't have to be fixed. Yeah, I mean, that's a big question. And (laughs) the thing that came to my mind is, you know, uh, global warming, climate change. If I could wave a magic wand and have that not be happening um, and have a different reality um, around climate change, that is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, there There are so many things we need to confront and rebuild and change. Um, and the precariousness of climate disaster and losing lands um, complicates and makes all the other work harder because of the toll of climate change, which includes, you know, the pandemic and mass death. Susan, is that different from, I, I think the question we, we sent you was, uh, what is the one task for humanity uh, in this historical moment? Can you speak to to that? Yeah, I mean, we are already in the midst of uh, devastating climate change. We are living in such precarious inequality. We are living um, with the reality of a growing police state here in the U.S. and around the world. Um, And all of those things have deadly consequences on a daily basis. So as a religious leader, 
when I think about what's important for humanity, I think about our conscience. I think about our capacity for compassion. I think about who we are as a living species on this planet. And so I think about how are we learning better practices of mutual care? How are we tending to collective care? Because with, with the work we need to do to organize for political change, we are still going to be facing hardships and having to adapt to the realities of climate change. We're not just stopping them. Like it's, we are living in them. And so I really do think that there is growth we need to do on a, on a human level around compassion, around an understanding of interdependence and care for our common humanity. And I think that takes spiritual practice, among other things. So that was more what my answer would be in terms of what does humanity most need. And I do look at that as a religious leader. That is my frame and my context. And I, I think about how we are going to understand our lives differently, such that we approach our challenges differently. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Carrie, we'd love to hear your hear your answer, and then we'll sort of dig into into everyone's responses. Yeah, absolutely. My I think my answer to the first question is similar than Susan's. Mine was a little narrower. I was like, you know, what we really need is like a cheap, easily accessible, environmentally sustainable battery that anyone can make and use. Because then you can use all the solar power you want. Problem with solar power, you know, it's not always when you need the energy. So that was like my much more practical version of that that would unlock a whole nother series of questions about, about the climate crisis. Yeah, it's, it's existential and it drives so many other things in our world um, about migration and about where people are able and willing to live and um, how we have to invest in every sector to imagine the future that's not that far away where like, almost every detail about our lives is going to have to change in order to uh, avert, you know, the, the worst case scenarios. Um, so I, I think you spoke to that well, Susan. Um, but it is, a, it's slightly different from what my answer to the post question, both of these are just like really softball, like easy questions. So let me, let me just um, appreciate that. Uh, but my, my answer to what humanity needs um, is, is a way to pause trauma cycles long enough to to address what is happening right in front of us one of the things that um that i've seen i think in the pandemic and i see it in i see it in our own association in our congregations i see it in the world is how much of our of our consciousness how much to the way that we understand where we belong and what we're doing is really rooted in personal and intergenerational trauma so you know real practically you all are both ministers and you know that all three of you are ministers. I'm the, I'm the non-minister. Uh, you know that in a congregation, if they had a real mess of a situation with their minister 40, 50 years ago, that that still lives on. It just lives in the walls. It lives in the way people think about religious authority and what it means to, to have a pastor in ways that just are self-perpetuating even when none of the original people are still there who were involved. We see it play out in, um, you know, in our communities, in our political landscape about disinvestment through, uh, you know, from our urban cores, through BIPOC, from our BIPOC communities. We see it in rural areas. We see it in post-industrial towns where there haven't been jobs since, you know, one, since Black Friday in 1979. I mean, we see these and they drive so many things uh, and they can be so easily exploited. and. And so I think that's present in, in all of our backyards. You don't have to go to the Middle East to find intergenerational trauma. And so like, it is, it's such a barrier to be able to do the work in front of us of healing, of rebuilding, of, of, of thinking with fresh uh, perspectives and, and relationship and coalition building. So, so I'm gonna go with the, I'm gonna go with the trauma pause button. I wish you had that button. I know. <laughs> we all wish we had that button. Yeah. You both seem really tuned into um, profound pastoral needs. And interestingly, you both also seem connected to like, what is the pain right in front of us for communities and for individuals with the idea that healing that is what actually heals so many of the really deeply, profoundly broken places 
in society around policing, about militarization, around climate, that that first we need to heal this the pain that's sort of right right here, right in front of us. I wondered, or I often see a lot of that brokenness as um, just the reflection of sort of the internal brokenness gets projected out into the rest of the world. We we live it out in our communities and and in our culture over and over again. I mean, it's it's interesting because healing is complicated because it's it, it's why we want that pause button, right? Because it's hard to heal when the trauma doesn't stop. You know, it feels like healing is something that happens after harm stops. And so I think, you know, part of the challenge is, you know, continuing to try to, you know, change systems and organize um, for different policy, uh, different uh, different conditions, while at the same time living in the midst of oppressive conditions. You know, it's the same kind of thing I, with climate is, you know, organizing for change, but also living with the reality of, you know, communities, you know, our families going without power, um, terrible storms, pandemic again not unrelated to climate change it's important to remember that you know I, I guess what I'm trying to say is that healing is for me it's in moments but it, it it's not it's the like the, the stopping of the harm is so critical to the healing and we're not there yet well, I was just gonna say, I think the really complicated piece here, right, is that there's there's the sort of forces of the world that we can shift and change that are oppressive and harmful, right? There's also then just the nature of life that at times is harmful, right? There's certain things we can't change them, but they're gonna happen and it's gonna be hard, right? And so figuring out where that sort of space is where we're not expecting everything to be sunshine and roses all day long, right? Because I think that's the real, to my mind, that's a real critical problem with the American West is the this notion of like, everything should be perfect as if that were a thing, right? Um, and if it's not, then it's horrible, right? But there is, so there's very real harm that can be changed. And then there's the reality of living, which is complicated and messy and difficult, even under the best of circumstances. And so helping people find a way to, to like live into the realities that are unchangeable and find healing and acceptance and a way to live in the world. And also though not then become complacent about the things that can be shifted and changed, right? And that's a that's an interesting line to walk. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's well said, right? And so many of our assumptions are based on false narratives, right? You talked about the American West, okay, well, that whole paradigm was based on essentially infinite possibilities for growth, right? That's what, and so if everybody gets their own ranch, then everybody's bought, you know, everybody's bought off, right? And there's always more land. Well, that's a lie, right? And like, first of all, you know, there were people there and the US government spent a lot of money and a lot of military might to clear indigenous peoples, break treaties, you know, and protect settler expansion. And that's not a part of the story at all. It's, it wasn't just there waiting for the, for the taking, right? Or about all of the people, descendants of slaves, immigrants who never even had the opportunity to, to access those lands. And by the way, it wasn't even, you know, settler life wasn't, uh, wasn't that easy either, right? So there's just so much marketing over time that has gone into these narratives. It is kind of a setup. Um, you know, we, we think about that it's not a, it's not the same parallel, but just the just the looking at where our assumptions come from, we think about that in church world sometimes because we have this assumption for what a church should be, what what it can operate as, and that a lot of that is rooted in this post-war 1950s, early 60s high mark of religious activity in the United States um, that was a historic an historic anomaly, and it was fueled in no small part. Um, yes, anti-communism and lots of things like that. Also, a lot of free labor from women who had been educated but were kept out of the workforce, right? So like we built a lot of our paradigms on this assumption that like, yeah, there'd be all the volunteering that you need. <laughs> and that is just not the case ever. So um, if I can just say one other thing though, I, you know, in, ter in terms of where, where this leads us, I, I do think, um, you know, nihilism about the world is, is kind of rational. Uh, in many ways, like it's, 
it's hard um, to imagine how we're going to avert the worst case scenarios in the climate crisis when you just read the headlines. So I think that it's valid, but I think that it is not, it, it's a dead end. It doesn't help us live our lives or, or even do the things that are possible. And I think this is a particular challenge for those of us on the left, the left of the political spectrum and the religious spectrum that um, we're just not that used to winning, I think is what I would say. Uh, and so there's been a lot of work on imagination in movement spaces in the last few years. And I think that's been really good. Um, but getting from like, I, I, I lack real hope and I can imagine a, a dream future, like the getting from the here to there takes a whole lot of discipline and practice and relationships and trust and adaptation that I think we're really only beginning to, to, to discover. Uh, and that that's a that's a huge challenge for us is taking seriously the work that it that uh, it takes to dig deep into these systems that we have plenty of plenty of critiques about, you know. Uh, but that's where the real work is. So that's that kind of takes me back to the battery thing of like, okay, I know that we're having real conversations about how to shift the carbon output of this planet when we're getting down to that level of detail about battery production, you know. Like that's what it's gonna take. And uh, you have to have some hope to be motivated to give it a shot. Carrie, you just said so much. I feel like, when can we have a retreat? <laughs> I wanna spend a weekend <laughs> digging into all of that. But it, there is a feeling for me of like, like a national reckoning with the false narrative needs to happen. And, and a national reckoning around the free labor. And what, you know, we sort of like fought the civil war and said, we don't have slavery anymore. And then never really acknowledged it. And then sort of had this period of where we were starting to kind of build new systems and then crashed them all and moved into this space that I think we're still in of denying what's real in, in all of the ways that racism has been embedded into our culture. And we haven't had, it seems to me, really honest reconciliation. We haven't spoken the truth in any public, consistent, national way. So it feels like when we're talking about trauma, if you know, what is the task in this healing of trauma that if we don't name that and do that primary work, we will continue to break all of the systems, right? There's no way to heal or to, as Susan, you were saying, like we can't, we can continuing the trauma, it's very hard to move past it, right? If we just keep doing it. And we're, we're again living with the death of yet another black man at the hands of police. And honestly, that that story has become so common that, you know, we're all almost, um, expecting we just expect like when is the next horror so it feels like you know all what's next for us like if there's a task it may be around naming like telling the truth and working toward a national if not global reconciliation process Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, oh. as you were talking, I thought, oh. <laughs> <laughs> to apologize. Just like, yeah. I mean, it's, I, you know, it is absolutely true that we do not tell the truth and we do not name things as a culture. Um, and we have that, you know, part of where I'm at is like, we are still in this battle, like in a lot of places, like Florida. You know, it's illegal to tell American history um, in any kind of honest, full way. Um, and in its, and I think Missouri has a similar bill, right? I mean, it's not just Florida. Um, so we're also still fighting forces that in the midst of crisis, you know, want to lean into supremacy thinking and domination thinking and that you know from unitarian universalism from my and our faith tradition we believe in that fundamental interdependence we're universalists 
right? We believe that we're in that, you know, while we don't have the same experience, like we are in it together, that our lives depend on each other and that we want for joy and equality, happiness, equity, thriving for everybody, right? And that that is the vision of heaven, not some get it and some don't, right? It's that it's for everybody. How do we live that here and now? And so, but there, you know, that isn't the only narrative out there. <laughs> not necessarily even in the dominant narrative. I'm not saying that the, you know, the, the narrative makes all the difference, but I just, I just know that there are a lot of people who think that that is wrong and who really are committed and believe in supremacy theories that that are okay with exploiting others for the benefit of the few and you know and there's visions of god that say that too right that in terms of i don't mean god god's self but i mean theologies of the saved and the damned right that that we you know that universalism uh refutes <laughs> for a different vision of humanity and of god so I don't know how theological you want to get, but I just, I, I just think about, yes, we're not telling the truth and we're still fighting to be able to tell the truth. I mean, the number of books bannings that are happening across the country, like our poor teachers <laughs> being threatened with, you know, firing criminal charges, various kinds of things for, for teaching. Like this is, this is such a, a you know, such a dangerous time in those respects. And so, yeah, we can't imagine what it's like to win and we're still in the battle for, to, you know, in the midst of losing ground, right? We've lost row. <laughs> There's so many things that we have, that we are losing and have lost. So it's, it's an interesting thing. I think it was you, Carrie, who said um, that in, or maybe I was thinking this when you were talking that in activist spaces, we use imagination that we, it's become, I know for me in climate activist spaces, it's been um, a source of tremendous power. Like, not, because we could talk a lot about tipping points and what's really happening and that we've actually passed the time when things, you know, like it, we've moved into the worst case scenario. So we could talk about that for a long time, but, but really, as an activist, like what's moving you? Come on, Peggy, like, where are you going, right? So the idea of imagination and what's possible, even given this particular moment, what is still possible? So I wonder if I could just pose to the two of you, what do you think is still possible? Like recognizing multi-generational trauma, recognizing that the harm is still happening, recognizing that we don't tell the truth, then what? What's possible? Gosh. Um, and we didn't even talk about mis all of the active misinformation that it is. I mean, we're criminalizing truth and misinformation is spreading. Uh, some of the, some of some ways I think are practical things of like, you know, regulating, stopping the way that certain types of social media are aggravating all this is just like, there are some ways we have to put the brakes on that, you know, and goodness knows the constitutional crisis pending with the U S Supreme court. So, I mean, I have some, I have some practical thoughts like that as 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 uh much as imagination as those things still take um i'm i'm sure we're all familiar right with this quote uh that king used about the arc of universe is long but it bends towards justice and king was riffing off of uh 19th century you know fiery abolitionist preacher the reverend theodore parker unitarian uh who talked about this arc of the universe and 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 i think that's that's kind of the question that I hear in, in where you're going with this, Peggy, is about how do you hold on to the right place in that arc as an activist and do the bending you can recognize, but it can't be predicated on the emotional satisfaction of hitting, you know, hitting justice. We got it, checkbox, there it is. Like that's a very unsatisfying thing. And I think, you know, the, the way that so many of us get excited and involved in wanting to change the world is because we have that tangible sense that this is what the future could be. So it's not a great organizing tactic with a new group of like fresh young activists to be like, also, I just need to let you down right now. That will not transpire whatever you dream of in the way that you dream it, right? Like, you know, 
but it is uh, like there. Are, I think um, I think it, through the pandemic, like I've just seen movement spaces trying to wrestle with sustainability and burnout and all of, all of these kinds of questions that I think are can be connected to that. Like, what's the what's the emotional investment required to sustain the work and um, and you can't you can't live like that and you can't sustain the work over the time that it takes. So, you know, that's the, I, I think we like good like paradigms, good mental models of thinking how what what am I doing on the arc that is not just, you know, sort of just faith uh, absent any other information and just, yes, I believe it'll happen, but also is not so small scale or, you know, just do the thing in front of you that lacks the strategy about the real bend, the real torque it takes to do the bending like that. Gosh, that's a hard place to live uh, of being as impactful as you can and putting all of your stuff you can into it without being too attached to the outcomes and being willing to shift. That's a really hard place. That's that. So that's what it feels like to me that we need is like a better ethos about that. It's like, it, it relates to a lot of work that I think Susan and I have tried to build within the UUA um, with people, you know, finding ways to shift the, the institution, the organization, the movement in lots of different ways. But it feels like a, a place where we're, we're really, yeah, we're lacking those kind of like deep theological paradigms and models and that, that make it that give us shorthand and, and allow us to think about how to build that sustainably. I, I agree with that, Carrie. And and the word that came to mind, I don't know if you phrased the question as what persists. Is that what you said or what? It, I don't know. That's what I heard, Peggy, in the end of your question. And I thought love persists. Like love is what we have. To me, that is the core um, that we, you know, as you said, I mean, tipping for all these things, right? We could go into all of that. And I often think of it, and it might be a little nihilistic, but I, I think, you know, yeah, we are in for hard times. That is what I expect. And how will I show up? You know, given who I am and what I believe and what I love and who I love, how will I show up? And that to me is like the the question that, that doesn't lead me to uh, disconnect, right? Because of love and feeling connected to others and to my own humanity, um, but also to others. And so um, I feel like, you know, that also means taking care of myself when I need to take care of myself, um, but, it, but it means being invested and that's built on a foundation of relationship and care. So to me, like hope, hope is in the struggle. And that's what I feel like I've learned from a lot of the long time grassroots activists that I've, you know, words that I've heard from folks fighting ICE and fighting deportation in order to stay with their families, that hope is in the struggle. Like it's not in the outcome. We can't control the outcome. And there's there's a lot of outcomes and there are wins and losses along the way. But hope is actually caring enough about your fellow neighbor and your people to be invested. And like that, it, like I feel hopeful in movements and in doing work because I feel connected and I feel connected to that imagination. You know, as King said, it's not like a, a powerless form of love or sentimental, right? It's a, a form of love that uses power to overturn injustice. And I know like in deep in movement work in my time in Arizona, it was my relationships. Like, of course I was going to show up even if I was tired. I mean, you know, sometimes I wasn't and couldn't show up because I couldn't, because I had other things, including family and all those things, but it was people I loved and cared for. So it was, that's a different ethos as well than just the, what's the right thing. Like we have to fight on a policy level, but being in the work with people who share the commitment and who you love is also a source for me of energy um, and hope for the long haul work. If, if I can also just say, I, I think that's so much at the core of what our religious communities are really here for. You can't, it's not just that you can't, you can't go it alone. It is that really theologically, actually, you lack the, you, you can't have those connections as, as, a, as a soul person. And the strength of those um, <laughs> connections that are built explicitly around shared values, not just shared organizing targets, but the deep value and hope uh, and, hold, and holding and supporting one another and giving grace to one another through that um, 
is is the real power and where we practice what it's like to do that in the world. You know, we practice the 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 injustice and oppression is the inversion of that. It is it's the antithesis of that. Of a it's a relationality and and objectification to dominate and that the the love in faith community organized around values and what is ultimately powerful and true is is the antithesis of that and that's why we practice it in or we we try to uh, in our faith. Well, and I. I think it's as close as we get to a pause button, right? A trauma pause button, right? Because there, we don't have that magic <laughs> much as we might wish to. And the closest we're going to get are those moments when collectively we can lean into joy or we can share the things that are this. So if hope is in the struggle, so is some degree of healing, right? That that's, it's in those relationships, in those communities, in that work that we can, if not pause, that we can find a way forward through even the sort of onslaught that we can't necessarily stop, right? And it's definitely, I think, a part of resilience. Absolutely. The joy, the singing, and and the care for each other. I mean, it's, you know, providing child care and meals and that that literal physical care that happens in community is about learning those, building those, feeling the impact of those so that we might share with others when we have capacity to share. And yeah. I've really seen that and I'm grateful to be a person of faith um, and to have that in my life. But I think it's not, you know, it's not necessarily typical and a lot of people don't see the value. And I think that it's important that religious communities see their mission internal and external, right? As both those things. I am so thrilled that we've had this time to talk to the two of you. I feel um, sort of knocked over by your wisdom and insight and compassion and connection, like really deep, profound connection to the world, to the the hurting world and the possible world, the, the vision of the world we dream about. And I'm absolutely so grateful to both of you for your service to our faith and for your service to the country and to the larger humanity and our, our grand mission. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Let me, I just say, just thank you. You know, um, doing having this conversation on this podcast is like a beautiful break from the long list of emails that I need to respond to in my day. So I just, <laughs> I agree. Thank you. you know, every once in a while you get to connect with like, oh, that's why yeah. I do it. <laughs> The world could be a beautiful place. That's why I have to answer 257 emails today. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you both so much. Thank you. You're welcome. So good to be with you. Mm -hmm.